What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go through the June 2022 Algebra 1 regions, and we're going through parts 2, 3, and 4, so let's get started. For question 25 here, we want to know if this product is rational or irrational. Now, to answer a question like this, you have to know what it means for something to be rational. So what I think about immediately when I hear rational numbers is I think of a number that could be expressed as a fraction, a over b, where a and b are integers. And just remember, integers are whole numbers, and that includes zero and negative numbers. So a and b are integers, and we say here that b is not zero, because obviously if b was zero, this would be undefined. So now when I go through with this, I would just multiply this out. We would have the square root of 1024, and we're going to multiply this by negative 3.4. And this is all calculator work. If you want to do some in-between work here, the square root of 1024 is 32. So this would equal 32 times negative 3.4. And if you go another step and multiply these two numbers together, this is going to equal negative 108.8. Now, just in case you don't know how to turn this into a fraction, I'll just show the step on the calculator. But we did 32 times negative 3.4. And once again, that gave us negative 108.8. But if you press math, enter, enter this turns the decimal into a fraction and this is going to help us to explain our answer so just copying what we had on the previous page this is equal to negative 544 over 5. so now how does this help us explain our answer well we could say this number is rational because it's the quotient of two integers Now, another explanation we could go with here, we could say that this is the product of two rational numbers, and you could also say the product of two rational numbers is rational, but this explanation also works here. Now, for question 26, let's say you forget the rules for transformation of functions. You could type both of these into the calculator. So if we switch back over to the TI view here, we could go to Y equals, and we could look at X squared, and then immediately under it, we could graph the transformation. We have X minus three in parentheses, that's being squared, and then we just tack on the minus four after this. So now if we were to graph both of these together, you can see the blue one is the parent function starting at the origin. That's x squared. But now how do we go from this one to this one? You can see we're going to the right one, two, three units, and we're going down one, two, three, four units. So we're shifting to the right three, and we're going down four. So now we can just write out our explanation. Now, just know my thought process for questions like this is that any time I have a function and x is replaced with something like x minus c, this will move the function c units to the right. Okay, so this is going to move a function c units to the right, whereas if I had x plus c, now we're going to go c units to the left here. So these are just little things to know if you didn't want to use a calculator. And just know if you have something like f of x and then you just add a constant to it, this is going to move it c units up. Okay, so notice here that minus 4 at the end shifted it down because it was not replacing the x with x minus 4. It was just tacked on at the end. And if I have f of x and then I subtract c, once again, I'm going to have the function shift c units down. Okay, so this is just good stuff to know if you don't want to rely on the calculator for questions like this. So question 27, we have this graph here of total profits over hours, and we want to determine the average rate of change in dollars per hour over this interval here. So the first thing that jumps in my head when I hear average rate of change is we have to know this formula for average rate of change. And if we're going from 1 to 4, what I'm thinking of right away is we're finding f of 4 minus f of 1 over 4 minus 1. But I know this isn't in terms of f of x, but that's just what pops into my head right away. So then if we look at the graph, Notice this is what's going on at x equals 4. We have a y value of 100. And then if we look at x equals 1, we have a y value of 40. So this is think of this as the point 140, and this is the point 4, 100. So now if we just write out our answer, we're doing the function value at 4, which is 100. So we have 100 minus the function value at 1 is 40. And then we're dividing by 4 minus 1. So now this is going to work out to 60 over 3, which simplifies to 20. But just know this is dollars per hour. They, that's how we want to write our answer. We want to write it in terms of dollars and then per hour. So let's we'll make that a little bit neater. And we'll just tack on the hours at the bottom here. So when this simplifies, 60 divided by 3 is 20. So it's going to be $20 per hour. So this is going to be our average rate of change from 1 to 4. 
Question 28, we have to subtract this from this and we have to express our answer as a monomial. Now, just know there's a very dangerous trap here. Don't do the first thing minus the second thing. They're telling us to subtract this from this one. So that means we're starting with six times x squared minus xy in parentheses and we're subtracting three x times x minus two y. So now we go forward with the algebra here. We're gonna distribute. And the reason why I know we're distributing, we're not factoring is because they told us to express our answer as a monomial. And that means one term. Okay, so this just this means our final answer is going to be one term at the end. So that's how I know I'm not going to try factoring or anything like that. So I have six times x squared is six x squared. And then six times minus x y is minus six x y. And now this part just be a little bit careful. A common mistake here is that people mess up with this minus sign, but just know you're distributing the minus with the three x. So here, if I do minus three x times x, that's minus three x squared. And this part, be very careful, minus 3x times minus 2y becomes a plus 6xy. But once again, they kind of telegraphed it by saying, write your answer as a monomial, because in order to have a monomial, we need stuff to cancel out and we need to be able to combine like terms. So we need one term at the end. And now notice here, minus 6xy cancels plus 6xy. And then 6x squared minus 3x squared gives us 3x squared, which is our final answer to 28. Question 29, we have this graph of a function and we have to state the domain and range. So there's a few ways we could write our answer, but when we're looking for the domain, what you should be thinking of for domain is domain, you should be thinking in terms of X values. So domain is you're looking at X values. And what are the possible X values here? Well, the fact that this thing has arrows at the end tells us it goes on and on all the way left and all the way right, which means any X value is possible here. So the domain of our function we could say our domain is simply going to be all real numbers. Okay, so that's perfectly sufficient here. Now, just know there's a few other ways we could express our answer. For domain, I could say something like this too. I could say from negative infinity to positive infinity like this. But this symbol is cool for all real numbers. You put the two vertical lines and then you make an R out of it. Now, for the next part, we want to know what are, what is the range. And when I'm thinking of the range, the range, we should be focusing now on the Y values. So once again, the range we should be thinking of y values here. And another concept that I think of for this is I think of a floor and a ceiling. So the floor and the ceiling essentially give you the bounds of your range. It tells you the floor is your smallest y value and the ceiling is your highest y value. So notice here, if I had to make a floor out of this, I would put the floor right here because this would contain the lowest y value. And notice this occurs at the point two and then we're going up one, two, three. So this, in a way, it's almost like a quadratic equation, and this is looking like the vertex. So the smallest y value is 3. So when I go to state the range here, what we could say is that y is the lowest value is going to be 3, but then what's the highest value? Well, we couldn't put a ceiling on this thing, because if we try to put a ceiling, see these arrows tell us it's just going to keep raising the roof. So that means our y values have to be greater than or equal to 3. Okay, because three is our minimum y value. All of the y values here are either three or greater. So y is greater than or equal to three is our range. Question 30, we have to solve algebraically for exact values of x. And notice they didn't tell us to round here, which makes me think our answer is either going to be a whole number or a fraction. Now for this one, we have a few options. We could do the quadratic formula. And the quadratic formula is arguably the best because it works in any case. But for this one here, I'll practice some other factoring techniques. We'll use the AC method. Now, where does the AC method come from and what is it referring to? Well, I think of any quadratic equation is in the form AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. So when we talk about the AC method, we're talking about the product of the first coefficient of X squared and the constant at the end. So here, AC would be six times negative six, which would be negative 36. And then our B value here is positive five. So then I need to come up with two numbers that have a product of negative 36 and a sum of five. And those two numbers would be nine and negative four. And the reason why I like the AC method is that if you mess up, you'll know as you're trying to factor this out. So then what we do with it is we rewrite this expression on the left as six X squared. And then instead of five X, we're gonna call it plus nine X and then minus four X like this. And then we have minus six and this is all equal to zero. So then what we do from here is we do factoring by grouping. So the greatest common factor between these two expressions is gonna be three X and we would be left with 2x plus 3. And then the next two expression, uh, the next two here, we could factor out a minus 2, and we would be left with 2x plus 3. Now, you know you're doing this process correctly if you get matching factors here. 
because then the next step is we're going to factor out 2x plus 3 from both of these. So now we can factor out the 2x plus 3 and we're going to have 2x plus 3 times and left on the first term we have 3x and then what's left on the second term we have a minus 2 that we're not taking away. So we have 2x plus 3 times 3x minus 2 is equal to 0. And then once you get to this step, you have one factor times another factor equals 0. The possibilities here is that either the first factor is equal to 0. So you'd have 2x plus 3 equals 0. Do minus 3, you'll have 2x equals minus 3, and then divide both sides by 2. And this will give you one solution, x equals negative 3 halves. And then what we could do is we could set our second factor equal to 0. So we set 3x minus 2 equal to 0. Add 2 to both sides, you'll have 3x equals 2. And then you'll have x equals 2 thirds after you divide. So then our two solutions here, we have two values for x. We have x equals negative 3 halves, and we also have x equals positive 2 thirds. So here is our answer to question 30. Question 31, we have to factor this expression completely. And that just means we have to keep factoring until we can't factor anymore. And what I look for first for questions like this is I always look for the greatest common factor first. So here I notice the greatest common factor is x squared. And if we take out an x squared, x to the fourth over x squared tells us we have x squared left. And if we divide this by x squared, we're going to have minus 36 left. So now once we get here, the next thing that jumps out at me is that we have a difference of two squares. And to factor this, we just write it as a plus b times a minus b, where we're taking the square root of the first and second term. So then once again from here, we're going to have x squared times, and then the difference of two squares here factors as x plus 6 times x minus 6. It really helps here to be sharp with some of your times tables, like knowing that 36 is a perfect square. It's equal to 6 times 6. Just allows you to factor this much quicker. Question 32, we're finding the roots of this quadratic equation and we're completing the square. So my thought process for a question like this is I have to identify the b term, cut it in half, and then square it. So what does that mean? We have ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So this is just representing any quadratic equation. And the b term refers to the coefficient of x. So right away, my attention shifts to taking half of negative 8, squaring it, and then adding that number to both sides. So what we're going to have is negative 4 squared is 16. So this is going to come into play soon. But what we could do for questions like this, for one, you could only do this half of the b term process when there's a 1 in front of the x squared. So we don't have to worry about dividing anything in the beginning. But what we'll do is we'll take that minus 5 next to the minus 8x, and we'll add it to the other side like this. And that's going to bring us to this step. We're going to have x squared minus 8x. I'm going to leave a space here after this canceled out. And this is going to equal 5. But now this is where we complete the square. We're going to add 16 to both sides. So we're going to add 16. And this completed the square for us. And what do we mean by complete the square? Well, now when we factor this, this is going to factor to x minus 4 times x minus 4. Or I could say x minus 4 squared. And I'm able to do that in my head. So a quick mental check is that negative 4 plus negative 4 is equal to negative 8. And when I multiply negative 4 by itself, that gives us positive 16. So that's how I know this is how it's going to factor. But notice we have a perfect square trinomial because we have x minus 4 times itself. So that's what we mean by completing the square. We turn this into a perfect square trinomial. Now on the right side, 5 plus 16 is 21. So that brings us to this step. And now this is a part we have to be very careful with. A very common mistake here is that we take the square root of both sides and students just say x minus 4 equals square root 21. But you have to be very careful. Another dangerous trap is that when you take the square root of x squared, it's not equal to x. It's equal to plus or minus x, or we could also say it's equal to absolute value x. So a common mistake, please abandon this mindset if you're still saying this, but the square root of x squared is not x. It's absolute value x or plus or minus x. So what I would say here is x minus 4 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 21. So now the last step here to solve for x, we're just going to add 4 to both sides. And we could write our answer in this one form like this. We could say it's equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of 21. Okay, so now we're up to part 3, and the questions are now worth 4 credits. So question 33, we have a graph of Sam's kite over a period of time. And it's modeling the height over time and time is in minutes and the first thing we have to do is explain what the zeros of the graph represent in the context of the situation well the zeros are over here at this time here at time zero and this looks like at time four t equals four minutes so if you think about it if this is modeling the height of the kite and it's nice that that rhymes then the zeros represent when the height is on the ground So 
So now for the next part of this, we have to state the time intervals over which the height of the kite is increasing. So notice here, the height is along the y-axis. So when the height is increasing, that means the graph is going up. So I'm just gonna highlight it in red here. The kite, the height of the kite is increasing from here to here, because it's going up, and then it starts to drop, and then at t equals one, it starts to go up again, all the way up to t equals two. And then from t equals two on is when the kite starts to drop back to the ground. So if we just state this formally here, the time intervals, notice we're counting by halves because I'm going zero and then there's a space and then one. So from zero to 0 0.5 is the first interval when the kite is going up. And then from t equals one to t equals two, the kite is going up. So I'll just say here union because I'm joining these sets together and from one to two. So these are the two intervals. For the last part of this, we wanna state the maximum height in feet that the kite reaches. So if we look here, the maximum height is gonna occur at the highest point of the graph because this is a graph of the height. So now we just have to count carefully. Notice along the y-axis, they're counting by tens because we're going from zero to 10 to 20 to 30, and then 40, we would have 50 and 60. So if we look here across the top, the maximum height of the graph is, or the maximum height of the kite is gonna be 60 feet. So the maximum height, we're just gonna say here is 60 feet. And we don't have to specify the time, but if we did have to, we would say the kite reaches its maximum height at t equals two minutes. So for question 34, we have a few things to do, but first we have to graph f of x and g of x. So if we switch over to the calculator view here, we'll type in f of x first. And f of x is equal to x squared minus one. So we could just borrow what we had before and just tack on a minus one. And then the second function is exponential is three to the x power. So here's both functions, and I'm just gonna press zoom six here to give us like a standard view. So if we look at these graphs here, notice that they have one point of intersection. And if I want this to be as accurate as possible, what I could do is I could go over to the table. And what we could do is we could start looking over here at some of the negative and positive values here. Now, since our graph is only gonna go from like negative 10 to 10, we're just gonna be focusing on these central values here. So I just wanna borrow this from the calculator to help us graph this. So what we're gonna do is we'll graph the quadratic first and x squared minus one, I think we could see is clearly the one in blue here. We're gonna have the point zero negative one. So that's gonna be down here. And then we'll have the point one zero. We'll have two threes, so we're going over two up one, two, three. And then after a point, uh, the highest point we could reach here is eight. So we would be going up to three, eight. So we're going over one, two, three, and up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like this. If we go any higher, see like nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, the next Y value would be 15, which would be too high. And because this graph is symmetric, we could just go ahead and use the symmetry of the graph to give us the other points like this. So now to the best of our artistic ability, we're just gonna connect this here. And this is gonna give us a picture of the first function. Now for the second function, the exponential three to the X, Right away, I noticed that three to the X has the point zero one. So we could go ahead and graph this here, but now we're going over to the point one three. So we're going over one, up one, two. So let's try to count carefully, up one, two, three like this. And then after this point, we have the point two nine. So we're going over two and going up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So here's another significant point. And if I try to go left a bit, we can see here that what we have is negative one, one third, which would put us like somewhere over here. So this is enough points for us to get the the idea behind what this graph will look like. And this one, we have to be a little bit more careful sketching it out. But here's our, and let me do that a little bit better. Because three, three to the X makes it increase a little bit faster than if it were two to the X. So it's gonna be a little bit steeper. So here's our graph of G of X. So I'll just label them. This is G of X in red. And then this is gonna be F of X in blue. So to finish out this question, we have based on the graph, for how many values of x does f of x equal g of x? And we have to actually explain our reasoning. Well, what I noticed right away is that there's exactly one point of intersection. And how do we know there's not a second point of intersection? Because once g of x surpasses f of x, g of x is an exponential function, f of x is quadratic. And just know exponential functions increase at a faster rate than power functions like x squared. So once g of x surpasses f of x, g of x is going to win that race forever. f of x will never catch up to g of x again. g of x is going to increase way faster. So we have one point of intersection. So that's why we have just one value of x that makes this true. So question 35, we have an insurance agent. They're looking at records and 
this is a bunch of data here, but the most important part is that we have to state the linear regression equation that models the relationship between X and Y here. And we're rounding all values to the nearest hundredth. So this is all calculated work. Now just know before you start looking for a linear regression equation, you should go to the catalog, press second zero, and you have to go to the diagnostics, which is the letter D. So I press alpha and then X to the negative one to speed things up here. And that just, so I don't have to scroll for a half hour. I could go down to diagnostics and I'm going to diagnostic on. That way when we start looking to input this data, it'll give us all the stuff we need, including the correlation coefficient we need later on. So now we go to stats and we're gonna edit and we're gonna create this table. The first list L1 is gonna be the X values and L2 will be the Y values, but I'm gonna do this at hyperspeed. So now that we have the data in the tables, what we could do is we're gonna to go to stats and we're gonna calculate linear regression. That's the one we need, number four. And just go ahead and press enter all the way down. And here we go. We have the coefficient of X, our slope is here. We have our Y intercept and we have our R value. So I'm just borrowing this from the previous screen here. So our linear regression equation is gonna be Y equals A times X and we're rounding to the nearest hundredth. So we're gonna have negative zero point. And notice we have nine, six, zero, which tells us we're gonna to round to nine, six. And then we write our X and then we have plus our Y intercept is B and we're rounding to the nearest hundredth. So we look at the three, we go to the right is an eight. So we're gonna round this up to seven, four. So we're gonna have 64.74. So here's our linear regression equation. Now for the second part of this question, we have to state the value of the correlation coefficient to the nearest hundredth. Then we have to explain what this means in the context of the problem. So the R value is easy to identify. That's just right from the calculator. But what does this mean? Since our R value is very, 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 very close to negative one, that means we have a strong negative correlation. And because this involves age X and percentage of accidents caused by speeding Y, this means there's a strong negative correlation between age and the percentage of accidents caused by speeding. Now, just know here that correlation does not imply causation, but once again, the data in the table is suggesting that younger people are at a higher risk of getting into a car accident caused by speeding. So please, if you're getting your license soon, just drive safely. Question 36, we're solving the system of inequalities graphically and we're labeling the solution set S. Now, my thought process for questions like this is I want to get these lines in the form Y equals MX plus B, because once a line is in this form, then you could easily identify the slope and you could identify the Y intercept. So this is called slope intercept form. So the first thing I wanna do for that line is, and it's an inequality, but I just imagine this is equals for a moment, is I'm gonna take the two X, I'm gonna move it to the other side. So we'd have three Y is less than, and if we subtract two X on both sides, we have minus two X plus nine. And then I would divide everything by three. So this brings us to the step, we're gonna have Y is less than negative two thirds X and then we have plus three. So this is our first inequality in a much better form because it's gonna allow us to graph this way nicer. Now the second one is basically finished for us. We just have to divide everything by two. And that would give us the second inequality. We'd have y is greater than or equal to. So you have greater than or equal to two x plus three. So that's our second inequality here. So now I'm just gonna graph both of them and I'll, co I'll color coordinate them here. So the first thing I graph is the y intercept which in this case is gonna be zero three because that's our plus B at the end. So I'm going up one, two, three, but just know this one I'm gonna put as an open circle because that first inequality is strictly less than, which means we're gonna have a dotted line in a moment. So now the slope tells us the rise over run. So my next thought process is that when I have a slope of negative two over three, like if that's my slope, this means I'm going down two and I'm going to the right three. So I'm going down to, and I don't know why I wrote a, a three here, but we're going down two. Let's just fix that. So down two, and we're going to the right three. So from here, I'm going down one, two, and I'm going over one, two, three. So that would be my next point. I could do that once more. I go down one, two, and over one, two, three like this. And if I wanna go backwards, instead of going down two to the right three, I could go up two to the left three. And now, how do I know if I'm doing this correctly? Well, these dots should start to form a straight line. If I mess up, and let's say I put a point over here, then I would it would be, obvious here that this is no longer just a straight line segment. So now I'm just gonna connect these with a dotted line like this. 
to the best of my artistic ability. Now, my advice is, is that if you're doing this at the Regents or you know whatever test you are taking, you could use something like a student ID or if you have a ruler or something to make this you know as neat as possible. But this is gonna be our first line here. We have it dotted and we're shading under the line because it's Y is less than. So less than means shade under. So this is gonna be our first solution set here. We're just shading this part here. So now for the second inequality here, this is a greater than or equal to, which means everything's gonna be solid. But now our Y intercept here is also zero three. So that means if this was previously open, we could now close it because of this one. And just know if it's opened, I'm sorry, if it starts out closed, you're not gonna open it because of this one. Like once it's closed, it stays closed. It doesn't reopen. And now the slope of this line is two. So we're going up one, two and over one here like this. We're going up two over one like this. And just know if you struggle to do this by hand without a calculator, you could always type this into the calculator as like y1 equals negative two thirds x plus three. And then you could type in the y2, two x plus three, and just make sure to make this one dotted and know how to shade. So once again, if you're just not trusting this mx plus b process, you could always use the calculator as support. So now to go backwards, instead of up two over one, I'm going down two to the left one like this. So this is gonna give us our second solution or our second solution set. So I'm gonna make this as neat as possible. So here's our second line here. And this time it's Y greater than or equal to. So we're gonna be shading above the line like this. So we're going this way. So when it comes to looking for our solution set here, our solution set is gonna be where they overlap, where red meets blue. And that's gonna be in this section over here. So we're gonna make a very clear S that that's our solution set in this space. So this second part is pretty nice. They want us to determine if the point zero 0.03 is a solution to the system of inequalities. Now, if we look at the point zero 0.03, that's over here. And you might be saying like, wait, this is on both lines. So yes, it's a solution, but it's not gonna be a solution here because remember that line in red is dotted. This is a dotted line, which means that it's, yes, it's a point on the blue line, but it's not technically a point on this red line because this red line is dotted. Now, if we really wanna justify our answer so we're 100% convinced, just remember the first inequality which modeled the solution that we colored in red here was coming from 2x plus 3y is less than nine. So if we really wanna show that it's not a solution, we could say no, because, and what we have is if we plug in x, we have two times x equals zero plus three times y equals three is less than nine. And then this implies two times zero cancels out. We have three times three is nine, but we have nine is less than nine. And we could say this is a false statement. So we have no, because this is a false statement. So that means this is not a solution to the system of inequalities. It's a solution to the blue inequality here, the stuff we have in blue, but it's not a solution to the red one. So that means it's not a solution to the system. So here we are, part four, the final question, and it's worth six credits. Question 37 is a little wordy, but we're at an amusement park. We have adult tickets and kid tickets, and adult tickets are modeled by A, child tickets are modeled by C. And now here's the first equation we could get out of this. For a group of six that include two children. So of course they had to put this in a little bit of a riddle for us. So there's six people. So let's just write this out. So we have six people. And so far what we have, we have two children. So if there's two children, which I'll abbreviate like this, that means there's four adults, okay? So they gave us a little bit of a riddle, like, all right, six people, two are children, so four have to be adults. So right away, what I'm seeing is we have four adults plus two children, and that's gonna be equal to, they told us 325.94. So 325.94. And we'll worry about dollar signs and all that at the end, but this is our first equation. And now we have a similar riddle for a group of five that include three children. So right away, I know we have three children. And if there's five people, well, three of them are children, two of them are adults, and the cost of their tickets is 256.95. So here's the system of equations that models this situation. So the next part here, we have to use our system to determine the exact cost of each type of ticket. And we're doing this algebraically, which means we can't just use the calculator for all this. So for this part here, there's a few ways we could go forward with this, but I like to do elimination, which means I want one of these pairs of letters to have matching coefficients, but they need to be opposite. 
So I'm looking at this top row and seeing everything here looks like it's divisible by two because they all end in even numbers. So to make the A's cancel out, I can multiply the top by negative one half. And just know if you put the entire equation in parentheses across the equal sign like this, that shows you're multiplying everything by the same number. So now we get to this step, negative one half times four A is gonna give us negative two A, negative one half times two C gives us minus one C. And this equals, and this part's just calculator work, but if we do negative one half times 325.94, that's equal to negative 162.97. All right, that I'm not gonna show because it's just, you know, multiplication. Now, this next part, I'm just gonna rewrite. We have 2A plus 3C is equal to 256.95 like this. So here's our new system of equations, which is better for us because now when we add these two together, notice the negative 2A plus 2A cancels. We have 3C plus negative C is gonna give us 2C equals. And then when we do the sum of these two numbers, or just think 256.95 minus that, that's gonna give us 93.98. So we have 93.98 like this. And now I just divide both sides by two. And this tells us here that C equals, and if we just divide that by two, C is gonna equal 46.99. So here's the value of the child ticket. It's gonna cost this much. So now when we wanna find the cost of the adult ticket, what we could do is we could pick any of these equations to plug back into. And let's say, I don't know, I just pick out this one here. Let's say I want to plug into this. So then I have four times A plus, and then what we're going to do is we're going to plug in for C. C is equal to 46.99, and this is equal to 325.94. So let's say I'm just starting out with this original equation here, and I'm plugging in to solve for A. So now what we could do is, well, we could multiply two times 46.99 that's going to work out to 93.98, which is what we had over here. So I'm just going to subtract this minus 93.98 on both sides. So I know I'm skipping one step here. I'm like, I'm not going to actually multiply this out because we already know what it's equal to. So when I subtract, like these things are equal. So they're going to cancel out when I subtract equal things. And now we have 4A equals. And now we're just taking the difference of these two. This is going to give us 4A equals. And we're going to have 231.96. So you can just check this out, but if you subtract those two, this is what you're gonna get. Now just divide both sides by four, and this tells us the value of A is equal to, and we're gonna have 57.99 like this. So if we have to write our answer out formally here, what we could say is the cost of each type of ticket, we could just label this really nice. We could say the adult ticket, so we'll just write it over here. The adult ticket is, and we have the dollar sign, 57.99, and then for the child ticket, it's going to be 46.99, right? Oh, and of course, in the beginning of the question, they said assume tax is included in all that. So this accounts for the tax as well. Now, for the last part of this question, they want us to determine the cost for a group of four, where that four includes three children. So right away, I'm seeing we're doing three children plus, and if there's four people in the group, that means there's one adult. So we're just going to evaluate this, and we already have the value for A and C. So now we're going to have three times and the cost of a child ticket, once again, is $46.99 like this. So we have three kid tickets plus one adult ticket, and the adult ticket was $57.99 like this. And if you just work this out, do three times this number plus one times this number, that's going to work out to, we would have a total bill here of $198.96. So this would be the total bill here for this combination.